Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Laurent Brochard. I'm an uh, intensivist at uh, the University of Toronto in Canada. I'm uh, going to discuss the um, topic of reverse triggering, which is a uh, an very frequent asynchrony and try to understand the meaning of this asynchrony. My laboratory is working with a number of companies which are listed here for research grants or for equipment. So a few years ago, uh, we described something which uh, was known in the field of chronic ventilation, but not in the ICU. We realized that some patients were not triggering the ventilator, but had respiratory muscle contraction, which were triggered by the mechanical insufflation. So we call this a reverse triggering phenomenon because the ventilator was triggering the breath. And as you can see on the tracing, you have the flow and the esophageal pressure. You see that intermittently in this patient, you have a big drop in esophageal pressure indicating a diaphragmatic contraction. And this always occurred after the mechanical insufflation. And in fact, we noticed that in a number of patients. This is another patient, in fact, the first recording we made where we use the electrical activity of the diaphragm, we, which you can see at the bottom. And this patient was supposed to be in pressure control ventilation with no spontaneous breathing activity. You see no deflection indicating that the patient would trigger the ventilator. But when we look at the electrical activity of the diaphragm, at every breath, and approximately starting in the middle of the breath, there was a contraction and an electrical activity. Uh, this was a very interesting finding because it could have important consequences. For instance, this is an example where this reverse triggering phenomena occurring almost at every mechanical insufflation were responsible for triggering a second breath. So we call it double cycling. It's not like double triggering because the patient is not triggering the first breath. But you see that every time there is this contraction, it's triggering a second breath. And of course, the patient was receiving twice the amount of ventilation which was set. Uh, in addition, and this is another example where you have the airway pressure, the esophageal pressure, and the flow, you see that not at every breath, but very frequently, there is a double cycling. So sometimes it does not induce double cycling, but the concern is that if these contractions are strong, they may occur mostly during expiration. You've seen this tracing, the top is the airway pressure, the middle is the esophageal pressure. And you see, because the contraction starts after the insufflation, it's right in the middle of expiration. So this is typical of what we call an eccentric contraction, which could be something very harmful for the muscle. So it could participate, for instance, to the high incidence of weakness of the diaphragm, which we observe in the ICU. So I'd like to show you two studies which were recently performed and giving some insights about this uh, mechanism, its incidence, and uh, maybe some of the mechanism. So this is a study which we did part uh, of another larger study where we systematically use the electrical activity of the diaphragm to detect what the patients were doing. And you have the example of two tracings. Here on the left, a patient on pressure control. And you see clearly that the electrical activity of the diaphragm is following the insufflation. So it's like, it's exactly what we call reverse triggering. It's a ventilator triggering the contraction. And on the right part, you see that at some point, so not every breast, but it triggered the second breath with breath stacking. So what we wanted to do first is to, de to have a method for automatic detection, and it was based on the electrical activity, and this showed that this method 
is working very well. So I think in the future, we will add more methods to have this automatic detection. And second, we wanted to know the incidence of uh, this, uh, or prevalence, if you wish. Uh, and we looked at patients uh, 24 hours after intubation, those who were on assist control. And overall, if you look at the whole patients, we had the prevalence of 8% of the breast with reverse triggering. But if you look at the detail, uh, in, in reality, you see a lot of patients with reverse triggering. Uh, this is the percentage of reverse triggering during the one hour tracings in the 40 patients we analyzed. And you see a little bit of reverse triggering is present in almost all the, of the patients. But of course, in many of the patients, it's only a very small percentage. In maybe 40% of the patients, it's more than 10% of the breast. So this was with a very sensitive detection. So maybe a less sensitive would, would say less patients. But you see, it's a very frequent phenomenon. And this is the same graph, but expressed on the right as the number of reverse triggering per minute. And again, you see that 40% of the patients have more than 10 or 12 or 15 reverse triggered breasts per minute. So it's a lot, and it looks really bad on the screen of the vent. Then we try to say, is there something which could explain why these patients have frequent reverse triggering? So we arbitrarily separated patients below the median and above. And in, in a, on average, we didn't see much. There, there was no clear explanation why the patient with reverse triggering had more or less uh, uh, different characteristics. Uh, in fact, maybe there was a little bit less severe. But what was surprising to us was the fact that patients with a lot of reverse triggering were much more frequently in uh, assisted ventilation like pressure support or even extubated in the next 24 hours. In other terms, it suggested that the presence of reverse triggering in sedated patients, right? These patients were sedated, suggests that the patient is in the process of going to trigger the ventilator. This is a second study which was performed in Argentina. This is a group of investigators who were interested by looking asynchrony during mechanical ventilation. Uh, this group is led by Pablo Rodriguez from uh, Buenos Aires and a lot of the respiratory therapists from the different centers in Argentina are participating to this study. And again, they had another algorithm to detect the uh, uh, reverse triggering, which uh, you can see here was uh, formerly detected by esophageal pressure. And they also wanted to see what was the incidence in patients having ARDS. Uh, it's again, a kind of snapshots because it's very short and you see uh, it's only a 30 minute recording. But the first result is that on their 100 patients, they found that 50 subjects had at least one reverse triggering detected. So again, something very frequent in at least half of the patients. And again, they try to see uh, what could predict the presence of uh, reverse triggering. And uh, interestingly, they found that the tidal volume was a predictor. In other terms, the lower the VT, uh, the higher is the risk or the possibility of having reverse triggering. And they also found that the lower the fentanyl dose, the higher the risk of reverse triggering. So reverse triggering was more frequent when volume was small, which is frequent now with lung protective ventilation, but also with a little bit less sedation. So in line with their own findings, suggesting that it predicts that the patient is going to switch to spontaneous ventilation. And on the right, you can see the entrainment pattern. 
So one-to-one -one means that you have a reverse triggered effort at every mechanical insufflation. One-to-two means that every other mechanical insufflation, you see this reverse triggered pattern. One to three means it's one every three breaths. And you see that most of the time, it's either one to one or one to two, but it's clear that you can see different patterns. It's, it, it seems to still be the same mechanism. So in conclusion, I would say reverse triggering is a new asynchrony, which, uh, seems to be very frequent. It has a very high incidence. We found that in patients in assist control under sedation, 24 hours after intubation, you see a little bit of reverse triggering in, every, in almost every patient. And in 40% of the patients, it, it's more than 10% of their breaths, which are followed by reverse triggering. You have seen in the ARDS patients, again, patients under sedation and assist control ventilation, that uh, half of the patients have at least some reverse triggering. Most of the breasts represent small efforts. So it's not huge contraction of the diaphragm, very frequently it's small, so probably with uh, little consequences, but the higher efforts, are clearly at risk of inducing double cycling and breast stacking, and may also be at risk of injuring the diaphragm, although we need more information of that. And lastly, it seems to be favored by the use of small tidal volume and be especially frequent at the transition from deep sedation to resumption of spontaneous breathing. So very exciting new findings, which may have important clinical consequences and which uh, suggest that we should continue to research and try to understand how to better manage these patients. Thank you very much for your attention, and I invite you to our course next year.